Excellent. Off you go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yeah, as, as Carson said, I'm uh, the warm up act for Mike, who's going to take you deeper into this thing we've built called Azure Kubernetes Service on Azure Stack HCI. And, and personally, I'm really proud of how far it's come in, in such an incredibly short space of time that I, I've been working on it. Um, and I know some of the folks like Mike have been working on it for, for even longer, but it feels like we've brought something to market that's incredibly compelling and it's just it's just exploding in popularity and it's come so quickly. So in this session, I'm gonna take you through everything you need to know just to get started, understanding what it is, what it isn't, where some of the integration points with Azure, it's a common theme that you've heard throughout the, the, the a day and a half so far of the session of the sessions there's a lot of integration touch points with azure in various different ways and aks on azure stack hci is definitely no different so let me kick off by setting some context as to where we started and many of you may be familiar with and some of you may have actually already started using kubernetes at scale in azure now we provide in azure a managed kubernetes solution called aks and that service all of the behind the scenes plumbing, the, the complexity of running and building Kubernetes infrastructure, we take care of that for you in Azure. So you as um, an IT operator, an, an, an application developer, an application owner can focus on what's important to you, which in this case is the applications. And as a result of running this service in Azure at hyperscale for many years now, we've learned a lot. And those learnings, not only technically, but how to operate, how to support, how to secure, all of those and more, we can amalgamate and bring as much as is relevant down to run on premises in your environments in the form of AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So we take all of that knowledge we've learned about running different customers environments at scale in the form of best practices that we make available to customers so they can learn and, and deploy in an optimal way for meeting the needs of their applications. We lock things up from the bottom to the top, from the physical data center security to the isolation of the physical infrastructure in Azure through the software layers, through the Kubernetes layers, through the image hardening, through the additional tools that we give you to put in place additional security controls like Azure policy and more, Azure Defenders, another good example we'll touch on later, we enable you to be secure by default and really drive very enhanced security for your applications in the context of Kubernetes. And something that was touched on in the uh, roundtable earlier on, and something that, that I know Carson's very passionate about, is, is support. The support in the context then was around Azure Stack HCI, but we take all of those learnings we've made through supporting this service at scale in Azure, all of those learnings through our CSS engineers, engaging with customers, learning about their environments, troubleshooting, their expertise is incredible, and they bring that now across to AKS HCI. And perhaps, I don't want to say the most important because security is top of mind for everybody, but unification of management as we embrace hybrid is important. To the point where if I'm giving you two different environments to manage two different Kubernetes solutions, that's not efficient. It's not the best use of your time. It doesn't enable you for success. So we want to unify management of Kubernetes infrastructures, not just in Azure and on Microsoft properties like AKS HCI, but also across other clouds that you may have invested in or may choose to invest in in the future where you may run Kubernetes uh, applications and workloads. We want to help you control, manage, and, and deliver the best experience for Kubernetes, no matter the platform. So that's a bit of background, but what are we doing? Uh, great animation. Um, uh, what are we doing to bring some of those capabilities, some of those learnings to you to run in your environment? And that's where AKS on Azure Stack HCI is, is essentially born. It brings that familiarity from a Kubernetes perspective, in particular for those developers, those uh, application owners who are looking at containerizing workloads, Kubernetes is, the de facto, de facto standard now within the enterprise and, and beyond. So we're bringing all of that, but we're hybridizing it. Uh, that may be a made up word, so I apologize. We are making it hybrid integrated by design, meaning from deployment time, it's integrated with Azure. So there is a connectivity requirement, but beyond that, we're packaging AKS HCI in a way that is easy to deploy. We'll actually see this in a few minutes. Easy to manage, 
it provides a great platform for running not just what you would assume in quotes would be Microsoft apps. So yes, it's great for .NET, whether you want to run those on Windows or Linux, but it's a great solution for other workloads that may run on Windows and Linux uh, platforms that you want to containerize. But it is, from a Windows perspective, the first class uh, Kubernetes solution for running Windows containerized workloads at scale. You can manage it through Windows Admin Center, or I know many of you will love PowerShell, so you can manage it through PowerShell as well. And increasingly, as we saw earlier when we were discussing uh, Azure Stack HCI, more and more functionality is being built into the Arc layer to enable you to manage from the cloud and benefit from all of the goodness that the cloud enables, such as uh, the ARM APIs, the integration with other Azure services that we'll look at shortly as well. And I touched on security earlier on. One of the, what I feel is one of the key advantages of of AKS HCI compared to alternative offerings out there is that it integrates with what many enterprises are embracing within their infrastructure today. Active Directory, Azure Active Directory in many ways through the Arc integration. It brings a, a level of management and control that Microsoft provides to make it easy for you to run and secure, both secured by default and as I mentioned before, the additional tools that you can place on top like Defender, Azure Policy, all contribute to enhancing the level of security uh, within the solution. So you've really got a secure by default, but you can even go even further uh, to, to ramp up that security to meet your needs. And because it's a service, it's evergreen. It's always up to date. Yes, we Microsoft provide you those updated images, those updated, those updates. You choose when you want to apply them, of which you could automate that very easily. So there is an element of control that you need to apply there. But fundamentally, you never have to worry about, do I move from the 2016 version of AKS on HCI to the 2019 or the 2022? It's just AKS on Azure Stack HCI. And we generally release a new build more or less every month. Sometimes it may be slightly longer uh, in between builds, but just recently that's been the typical cadence and the upgrade procedures and processes are very, very straightforward and easy to enable you to upgrade your Kubernetes clusters that are running your apps, but also the AKS infrastructure that's that's managing and powering the overall solution. We drill into what, our, what I'll class actually as a more of a architecture slide than a true architecture slide. Um, I've got one, uh, a better architecture view in a minute, but I, I'll not go too deep on that because I'd love Mike to go deeper in his session on those. But at the base, what do we need to run this, this Kubernetes solution? Well, we need a Hyper-V virtualization platform at a high level in the form of either Azure Stack HCI 20H2 today or Windows Server 2019 with Hyper-V today. So those are your two solutions for running AKS on top of. Now with Azure Stack HCI, as we know, it's hyper-converged. With a Windows Server-based Hyper-V cluster, you've got a little bit more flexibility. You can go down an S2D HCI configuration, or you can use uh, remote storage like, uh, like SAN, whatever your preference. We support both from an AKS HCI perspective. As long as it prevent, presents a cluster shared volume, you're good to go. And then the value that AKS brings specifically are the three middle layers, predominantly the, the two that Microsoft uh, are delivering more heavily and then integrating with the rest of the goodness that the, the Kubernetes solution and the community are contributing to. So those bottom two layers there, we Microsoft provide the virtual machine images, container hosts if you prefer, for running the Kubernetes infrastructure. Now we provide the Linux based solution in the form of our Mariner uh, Linux OS. So we provide that image, that VHDX, you don't have to create it yourself, you don't have to change it or optimize it, it's, it's configured for you by default. We also provide the Windows equivalent and the Windows equivalent will enable you to deploy containers on either server core or nano server if you, if you have a preference there. With the container host images, as we said, uh, we Microsoft uh, ensure that those are updated. You choose when to apply them, but we uh, provide those for you. And then we needed to make sure that this Kubernetes solution could work effectively with the underlying infrastructure, Azure Stack HCI, Windows Server, etc. So for that, that's where our big contributions really start in the form of our storage integration, our network integration, and our cluster integration. Because when Kubernetes says, I need to deploy a new worker node, 
It needs to be able to talk to Hyper-V to spin up the VM. It needs to be able to configure the virtual networks. It needs to lay that images or those images down in some form of storage. And it needs to make those workloads, those workers highly available. All of those are just a, a sprinkling of some of the ways that we have touch points into Kubernetes there. And then we obviously integrate and provide a Kubernetes compliance solution, which is AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So all of the things that your development teams, your um, uh, customers that you may be working with or yourselves, all of the things that you may have experienced today with Kubernetes, whether it's around monitoring, whether it's around integration with certain backup tools, or, this is at the end of the day, AKS HCI is delivering a compliant Kubernetes solution. So your investments in tooling and expertise and uh, the ecosystem work should work just as well with AKS HCI as it would on any other Kubernetes solution that might be out there. And then once you've got that Kubernetes layer deployed and you're ready to deploy your workloads, you have a little bit of a choice to make as to how you want to manage it. As I mentioned, if you've got existing investments in certain Kubernetes type tooling, you could go ahead and use that, no problem. However, Microsoft wants to make Arc the best place to manage Kubernetes clusters, no matter where they are. Whether they're running AKS on Azure Stack HCI, whether they're running OpenShift, Tanzu in another public cloud, you name it, we want to manage that Kubernetes cluster because we feel we can do a brilliant job of doing that. So optionally, you can choose to integrate your Kubernetes clusters in AKS HCI with Azure Arc. And we'll actually see a bit more of what that looks like a bit later on. But that opens the door to efficient management, uh, application of policies to enable you to achieve governance and standardization, the ability to deploy applications easily and efficiently through GitOps, which may be a new term uh, to some of you. You may have heard of DevOps. This is slightly different, but using Git as a source of truth uh, for your applications where your developers are building apps, pushing their code into a Git repository of some sort, it doesn't have to be GitHub. Uh, and from there, the engines within Azure Arc take that checked in code and orchestrate the deployment of applications down to um, to your AKS HCI based clusters. So it's incredibly powerful, really easy to get going with. So it does open the door to uh, as an organization embracing Kubernetes in an efficient way without needing a PhD in Kubernetes. Is, and that's from my perspective is, is incredibly important because it lowers the bar of entry. So I'm not going to touch on this in too much depth because I think Michael will go through this in more depth later on. But what fundamentally gets deployed when you run an installation of, of AKS HCI? Well, on the left, we've got this management cluster. I personally refer to this as the, the brains of the operation. It's the first thing that gets deployed. It's a single VM. And from there, once that is deployed, you use that management cluster to orchestrate deployment of subsequent pieces of the infrastructure, such as the target clusters or workload clusters, as it's called on the slide. And they are essentially where your apps will run. And you'll see lots of Linux little penguins there. The vast majority of AKS HCI runs our Mariner OS. Uh, so all of the load balancer, the control planes, the, uh, the the management pieces run Linux. And then when it comes to the workers, you've worker nodes where your, um, your apps will ultimately run. That's where you have a choice of do you deploy a Windows based uh, solution or a Linux based solution? So that's a bit about the architecture. And, and as I said, it can run on either Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 uh, today. We are obviously in the works to validate later releases of each of those platforms because customers are, are asking us to do that and, and they want to embrace those more modern platforms. Um, and 21H2 and Windows Server 2022 are, are those platforms. So stay tuned for news on that in the future. But, um, but today, right now, it's Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 as, as your uh, Hyper-V layer, if you will. But what are your options for kicking the tires with this versus production? Well, if you wanted to go full steam into production and start containerizing your applications on AKS HCI, the production deployment scenario would be to run this on either an Azure Stack HCI 20H2 multi-node cluster. Obviously, Azure Stack HCI is a minimum of two nodes, so it's always going to be multi-node uh, on validated physical hardware from the catalog. And that is our primary subscription based solution, if you will. Azure Stack HCI and the core based subscription, AKS HCI with its subscription model. 
However, if you've got an investment or a preference for Windows Server Hyper-V based clusters, as long as it's a cluster, you'd be supported in production in the same way there. When it comes to evaluation, you've got a couple of options. If you've got a spare piece of physical hardware, because don't we all, uh, even if it's just a single node, running Windows Server 2019 with Hyper-V, you can install AKSHCI on there and, and kick the tires and test all of the different pieces, the installation, the target clusters, the integration with Arc and, and more. If you've no hardware, you want to test it inside an Azure VM, we've got some useful automation guidance in our um, evaluation guides, which you can use. And I know Jeremy has got a, um, a scenario in, w, in MS Lab as well that you could also choose to deploy. So lots of different ways. Uh, we just love you to experience it and see how easy it is to get going with something that is actually quite scary under the covers, which is it's Kubernetes. It's complex. It's hard. We make it easy. So I want to prove it to you how easy it is. Uh, and with the first demo, I'm going to I'm going to walk you through uh, deploying the uh, the management cluster. So at this stage, I've got a vanilla environment. I've not deployed any Kubernetes pieces yet, and I'm going to deploy the the initial infrastructure before I then go on and deploy uh, some of the um, target clusters to run our workloads. So in this case, familiar screen, Windows Admin Center, many of you will have uh, will have seen it before. Usual kind of prereqs, check you've got a system that's got CSVs and this amount of space and memory and so on. Once you've done that, provide some creds that you can connect to the environment. In my case, I'm running this on a single uh, Windows Server 2019 machine. So this is a single host evaluation, but the process is identical for the most part when you're running with um, uh, an Azure Stack HCI cluster. Some of these values on the screen may look slightly different in terms of larger memory more likely. Um, it would uh, separate out the different um, uh, nodes within your cluster. The key thing it's looking for here is that all of the necessary pieces, roles, features are in place. And if they are not in place, AKS HCI can turn those on, apply those, and whatever they may be. So in this case, it's firewall rules and a few other bits. Cred SSP, everyone loves Cred SSP, we've got to enable that. And now we're just specifying where are we going to store stuff? How are we going to connect stuff from a networking perspective? Oops, you'll see we support um, DHCP and static IP addressing and integration with VLANs and you choose your virtual switch. Very straightforward stuff for, for any experienced uh, Windows Server slash Hyper-V uh, admin. We're defining some network settings here, what we call the load balance, balancer settings. And these are essentially an IP range that AKS HCI will manage for you and, and allocate to the different services that are, are going to be running in the environment. My advice, where we've seen a number of customers come unstuck here is they've set these ranges without perhaps doing a full validation of if workloads are already using some of these IPs in advance. So definitely Matt's tip of the day, check that your ranges aren't being used by other things, check that you're not setting this one here and also setting it as a DHCP range elsewhere. You're going to get into, into some deployment failures potentially where IPs are already used and, and you've got duplicate IPs in the environment. So um, we're working on understanding how we can help with validating some of those scenarios. But right now, my advice is definitely make sure you're you're checking all of the different things you're providing. DNS is another that catches people out. So make sure the DNS resolution is, is properly operating in your environment. The next step in the wizard is to integrate with Azure. Now, it's as simple as providing some creds, choosing a subscription that you've got permissions to, providing a resource group new or existing in a particular region, and once you've selected all those pieces, that's essentially it. From there, it will go through the review. It'll integrate and capture all of those um, uh, registration uh, integration pieces and necessary information. And from there, it will lock that set. All of those settings you've made will be locked into a, a configuration that when you click deploy new cluster, it deploys that. It's almost like a building a template of what you want to deploy. 12 minutes in my environment. Not too shabby at all, pretty quick. And we then have our AKS HCI management infrastructure deployed. So at this stage, no workloads. I can't just go and start deploying apps to this cluster. It's literally just the AKS management pieces deployed. And then from there, 
Obviously, those of you who are more uh, have a preference for PowerShell. OK, whack looked easy, but how easy is in PowerShell? Well, let's count here. So one, two, three. If it's a long, it would be a long line, but I'm still counting it as one line. One, two, three. The VNet is optional here in terms of whether you use DHCP or static, so I'm still counting that as just three lines. Four for the config, five for the registration, six lines. Six lines of PowerShell to do what I just did in the WAC uh, UI. The end result is the same. You can see how with DHCP it's asking for just a few settings relating to the um, the IP range that's going to be allocated by AKSHI for services running in Kubernetes. The initialize is that same as that step where it's checking the nodes to, for roles, features, WinRM, the usual stuff you'd expect. The config is where we lock in all of the, sele the selections we've made, including where we're going to store stuff, where we're going to place VMs, a cluster IP address that's going to get created as part of deployment, and then the registration. Um, OK, there might be a couple more lines if you're locking in some of these variables, but you know, six to eight lines, I think you get away with. And then you run the installation. And that, from a PowerShell perspective, is easy, it's automatable, it's consistent, and it can be easily standardized. Uh, so you've definitely got a solution there where if you're looking at uh, streamlining how you roll this out to new locations, edge locations, repeated deployments, PowerShell is your friend there for sure. So going back to the architecture, we've done the bit on the left here. We've deployed the management cluster. Next, we're going to deploy a workload cluster. So we're just going to do one for the purpose of this uh, demonstration. So what does that look like in Windows Admin Center? And then I'll, I'll give you the PowerShell equivalent. I'll give you a hint right now. It's less than six lines. But anyway, here's the, the Admin Center version. And admittedly, when you run this, this um, if you test this, you play with this, uh, this uh, extension yourselves, you might find that some of the screens have slightly different details. You know, we, as I said, we release builds nearly every month. So there are always subtle changes happening that can make things easier and, and more efficient. So same kind of thing as we saw before, some prereqs, what do we need for space-wise to deploy this particular Kubernetes workload cluster. In this case, we'll provide some basic information. And this is where I was referring to that optional step of, do I want to integrate this target cluster where my workloads will run with Azure Arc? I don't have to. It's included within the license fee or the subscription fee of running AKS HCI. So whether you choose to enable it or not, you, you can. You, you can. Uh, all I need to provide again is the appropriate subscription credentials, resource group, region, et cetera. So nothing, nothing too crazy here. So I'm going to choose uh, a particular resource group that's pre-created. It's already detected a number of these um, settings here. Which Kubernetes cluster am I going to deploy to? Oh, sorry, which uh, uh, HCI cluster running AKS HCI? Give it a name, choose a version if, for this target cluster if I have a preference, and then I can define some sizes for my different um, components. And then we have some steps to create what essentially are groups of worker nodes that are related by operating system. So for instance, if I would like to create a pool of Linux worker nodes, I'd follow these steps here, choose my size. And more recently, we've updated the node pool functionality to give you more granularity around different sizes and uh, virtual machines within the different node pools. I'm gonna in this case, create a node pool for both Linux and Windows. And you might think, oh, well, why is that significant? Why, what, what is, what's the big deal about putting a Linux and a Windows pool in the same cluster here? Well, actually, from a manageability perspective, that's actually a good thing because I can manage that cluster containing the two node pools as a single object. From a policy perspective, it gives me some extra granularity. It's a, it's a useful, but not compulsory. You could obviously have a separate cluster for Linux and Windows pools if you prefer, but you don't have to. So next, I mentioned earlier around security. One of the things that uniquely differentiates AKS HCI is that depth integration with what enterprises are running today. And that in many cases is Active Directory from an authentication perspective. So the ability to integrate AD with your AKS HCI environment is an important ask, uh, important ask that we've addressed uh, within uh, AKS HCI from customers. So. We're proud of the work we've done in this space. I'm not going to use it for the purpose of this demo. I'm just going to go on and choose my particular virtual network and my type of 
network configuration that I want, in my case, Calico, which is now the default, and review, and then click Create. And now I'm going off to deploy my target cluster that will ultimately run my workloads. And that one took 22 minutes. OK, well, that, why is that? Why was that longer than the, the management infrastructure? Well, this time around, it has to download a slightly bigger Windows container image. It doesn't download that initially when you install AKSHI because at that stage, it doesn't know whether you're going to run Windows worker nodes. Now that you've established a node pool, it downloads that image at this time, and that takes a few minutes to download, extract, and then create those create those virtual machines from that image. Hence, why the time is a little bit longer. And so, 22 minutes for that cluster, all done. And now we have our Kubernetes target cluster linked to Azure. So I click on the link there. It takes me to the Azure portal, and I see my Kubernetes cluster that's running on premises, integrated into Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes. And from there, I can go on and integrate with additional Azure services, both Kubernetes related like GitOps and policy, but also monitoring uh, and more. And I'll touch on some more of those a bit later on. But you saw how easy it was to onboard there. So when we think about in PowerShell, I've actually missed one line off here, so I apologize, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll explain which one I've missed. Uh, some of you eagle eyed folks may, may know which one. Firstly, to create the cluster, I use this top line. New AKSHI cluster, you have to create one with at least a Linux node pool. I don't have to create a Windows node pool if I don't need one, but I at least need to create a Linux node pool. And if I miss that out, it's going to create one anyway. So you can actually, I think, get away with just doing new AKSHI cluster name and it will just create one. Um, but I'm providing a few more um, uh, parameters here. There's additional parameters you can also provide around VM size, um, and, and additional um, uh, parameters that can shape your deployment to your needs. I can then add a node pool for Windows, in this case referencing the same cluster, this time providing a Windows node pool name, one worker node of OS type Windows. And then from there, if I need to scale up my workers in either one of the node pools, I just pass the node, uh, the actual cluster name, the name of the node pool, and the number of um, workers that I want to scale to. In this case, the Linux node pool for two nodes, please. And then if I want to scale the control planes, which a control plane is deployed by default, at least one is deployed. You'll see it says control plane node count one at the top here. When you deploy a new target cluster, we'll deploy at least one control plane node and a load balancer node, uh, as well as your worker nodes. So this is this command here is just an instance of me scaling that out. So technically, if I just wanted to deploy a cluster and not scale it with Windows and Linux, it's only two lines. The one line I've missed off this slide is the Azure Arc integration, and that's a simple enable dash Azure Arc integration, I think off the top of my head for the cluster name, and it will go ahead and, and integrate that with Azure Arc. So either way, two or three lines automated, and you've got a new Kubernetes cluster that's integrated with Azure Arc. So really easy stuff. So hopefully that's not scared anybody off uh, and you have realizing, oh, well, actually, I don't need a, a PhD or to be a doctor of Kubernetes to, to, to really use this valuably within my environment. But when would you use it? When are the best times to think, well, actually, Kubernetes could be a great solution for this and AKS on HCI in particular? Well, if you have investments already in AKS today, we're speaking with customers very regularly around, I've deployed this in AKS in Azure. I want to bring it down and run it at the edge, run it in my data center for compliance, for data gravity, for data sovereignty, whatever it may be. I want to run that same application or an instance of on-premises in my data center. And by bringing AKS HCI on top of Azure Stack HCI, it enables them a very streamlined on-ramp to be able to do that. That's not to guarantee that every app you could just literally copy and paste without modification. There may be instances where apps in Azure are utilizing features in AKS that don't exist yet in AKS HCI. But for the most part, our goal is to deliver an, an AKS consistent solution on premises that does enable you to do that in the future. I've talked about the platform supporting both Windows and Linux applications. We're actually working on tooling separate to AKS HCI, more so for Azure at this point, 
that can help you take applications running in VMs or on physical servers through Azure Migrate and containerize them to run on AKS in Azure. So with an extra hop and taking those files uh, and binaries and, and code, you could technically then move them down to AKS uh, running on HCI. But either way, how you modernize is up to you, how you modernize these applications, but modernizing them onto a Kubernetes platform running on HCI is, is a powerful and flexible way to do that. And because it's a subscription-based solution, you pay for what you use. So you start small and you, you grow to your needs as and when the business demands. But my favorite thing that AKS on Azure Stack HCI is enabling is an on-ramp to consuming some of these additional Azure services that running these on-premises for reasons of network latency, data sovereignty, data gravity, uh, compliance. I think it's an incredible way to consume PaaS services like SQL Managed Instance or Arc Enabled Data Services specifically, the Azure App Service, these are services that historically have only ever lived in Azure. They've only been available in Microsoft data centers. Now, through the power of Kubernetes, we're able to decouple those services from running exclusively in Azure and enable you to run them on Kubernetes in your own environment. So once you've got the AKS HCI platform deployed, as we saw in the previous two demos, you've then got a platform to bring AKS apps down You've got a platform to modernize existing applications from monolithic VM environments. And you've also got the opportunity to easily bring Azure services down, PaaS services to run on premises in the form of data services, app services, machine learning, and more. And that's attractive because it's a hell of a lot easier than building those kind of services yourself. And they're all subscription based, so you pay for what you use. So, I wanted to visualize how what, what some of the elements I've just described and dive into some of the areas where the Azure management, the Arc integration really shines. So imagine you've got a, an infrastructure, you've got this validated hardware from great partners uh, like Lenovo, who we've had on the, on the call. You've deployed your Azure Stack HCI infrastructure uh, or alternatively, uh, Windows Server 2019 Hyper-V with a cluster and you're running happily virtual machines, traditional VMs running your applications, but you wanna go down that modernizing path. And as soon as you introduce AKS HCI, not only do you open the door to modernizing your uh, applications into containers, but through integration with Azure Arc, you open the door to a method of applying standardization and governance through Azure policy but also a new way to deploy applications in a centralized, streamlined way through GitOps. And I've actually got a demo of that to show you to help illustrate A, how easy it is, and B, what the impact of that is. So let me go over to this uh, Arc Enable Kubernetes demo. What you should see is where we pretty much left off before, uh, albeit we were in the, um, the Azure environment uh, when we left the demo, but I can quickly revisit that. So what I've got here is that AKS HCI cluster that I deployed, and I'm going to go up to Azure and check out that uh, instance. As we recall, it was Arc registered automatically through deployment with Windows Admin Center, so nothing else I, I need to do specifically. Back into Azure, I've got this GitOps integration tile, I've got policy, I've got integration with monitoring, automation, all of these things get lit up now that my cluster is Arc enabled. But fundamentally, what I want to show in this demo is how I can start to deploy applications and workloads. And to do that, I'm not going to use policy. That's for compliance and governance. I'm going to use the GitOps tooling, which is a powerful way of automating deployments from that central Git repository. GitHub is a great example, but it could be an alternative enterprise on-prem Git. It could be an alternative public Git repo, whatever it may be. Now, in order to do that, I've got to add what we call a configuration. Now I have none so far, uh, and so nothing is happening. It, the uh, Arc Enable Kubernetes is not changing my cluster in any way. It's not deploying any apps to my Kubernetes cluster. It's not doing anything at this point. So I need to define this configuration. Now I can do it programmatically through something like Azure CLI, or if I prefer, I can do it graphically. And if you want to do it graphically, all I do is click Add Configuration. I provide some basic parameters, name, uh, instance name, whether I want to, uh, what my operator type is, which is Flux today, but we're working on 
uh, alternatives and updates to that. You'll see I provide a repository URL as well, which is me basically saying point to this repo, in which case could be GitHub, and pull the code from there. And so in this case, I've got a cluster config here that I've, uh, here's one I created earlier, cooking show style. And if I uh, bring that one up and show you some of the settings I chose, what you'll see is all of those parameters have been defined, names, etc. It's going to check GitHub every three seconds, which is mildly aggressive, but you know our developers are very proactive, they're very busy, so they're always checking in code. Uh, so it's going to check that Git repository, and this one in particular is my personal GitHub with a Hello Arc application uh, that's that's housed in that GitHub location or re repository more specifically. So what happens now is every couple of seconds it's going to pull that GitHub and if it detects a change or for the first time it identifies that application, it's going to go ahead and use the Flux operator and the uh, GitOps capabilities to grab that code, grab all of the necessary pieces and deploy that application down to my, um, my Kubernetes cluster that this configuration is attached to. So if I bring up my Kubernetes uh, cluster and, and in fact I'll look at the application first, so I'll go to the IP address of this highly sophisticated enterprise application that I've modernized on premises. It's a web app with a, uh, a banner that says this is Azure Arc GitOps demo, but it's cycling through the pods, the pods that are essentially running this application, of which there are uh, three, I think, in this case. And I set a special extension in Edge that's going to refresh the page every two seconds so we can see the changes more quickly. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to open my uh, direct link into my Git repo, as all, of the, as all developers should do. We should be checking code right into the main branch, obviously not, uh, but I'm going to do that. Uh, and there's the value that matches what's on the right hand side of the screen uh, in the main web app here. So that's that's the kind of key feature, if you will, that I'm going to change. Um, for those of you who want to see what's going on under the covers, I'm going to bring up this little PowerShell window here as well. And that's going to essentially allow me when I run this watcher command to just see what's happening with the Hello Arc um, pods that are running the application that's shown on the right hand side. And you can see the little uh, letters that make up this application are matching those on the pod on the right hand side. So let's make an important enterprise change. Uh, so we'll check in. This is an awesome uh, Azure Arc GitOps demo. We'll commit this straight to the main branch. And from there, just watch the PowerShell window. Stuff's happening. Yeah, things are being created, things are being destroyed, things are being created, pending, new things are coming online. Things are happening in real time. I've, I've not sped this up, this is just how it's happening. And from there, we've now got our application on the right hand side that, blink and you miss it, is now running the awesome Azure Arc demo. All the three pods that are making up this application are now running the updated version. So that was how I checked in code into a central Git repository and GitOps just took it and deployed it to the cluster that had the configuration applied to it. The more clusters that have the configuration applied, the more broad reach that up, that upgrade would have. So it's great that we can deploy. It's easy. It's great that we can automate app deployments. That's easy as well, but we've got to get visibility into what's happening. And that's where integration with Azure Monitor, uh, specifically monitoring the Kubernetes layer, provides a lot of value as well. And you'll see I've, got, I've gathered a few screens here that illustrate some of the different views in respect of containers. So you'll see in this case, we're looking at all of our monitored clusters that have been uh, added in to our, our views here, our Azure Monitor for containers. You see a big list of our clusters. It's got AKS, it could be AKS HCI, OpenShift and more. We get version information, number of nodes, their status, the pods, very useful information for monitoring Kubernetes. When we dig a bit deeper, everyone loves nice graphs. These are a little bit flat, but you know that's fine. We're doing well on utilization, low at least. Uh, and the number of node counts is fluctuating here and there, but we're getting visibility through rich and customizable graphs to understand what's happening in our environment. And as a result, we can also alert on some of these insights as well. When we drill into, in this case, the nodes that make up our Kubernetes clusters, we can see information about what's running on the particular nodes in terms of agents, pods, and so on. 
drill in a little bit further into specific controllers uh, that have been deployed as part of application. You'll see a proxy uh, controller there. There's an OMS related monitoring agent there. We're getting information into what those are like in terms of their use, usage, utilization. And then the containers themselves that ultimately are running the application. So we've got a Azure voting app front end, the back end, the OMS agents. So some of the agents that we deploy down onto the Kubernetes clusters are themselves containerized. So hence why you're seeing them in this view and the different pods and nodes that those are running on. So you knew that if you were having a problem with an app, you could quickly correlate it to a particular pod or a particular node within that cluster and understand if it's encountering issues, the usage, the capacity, thresholds, etc. And then when it comes to protection, I mentioned before that we do a lot of the hard work under the covers to make sure that Kubernetes with AKS HCI is, is secure by default. But there are certain things that we allow you to add on top to enable you to enhance to a level of security that you may require specifically in your environment. So in this case, we're looking at uh, what's the value out of, of things like Azure Defender for Kubernetes, which allows me to centrally manage all of my Kubernetes resources in the context of applying security and detecting compliance against certain um, security settings that we may wish to apply. So we can see alerts by severity, we can see information about what's been detected there and the impact. Uh, so all of these are very useful insights from a security perspective uh, within uh, and applied to not just AKS HCI, but any Kubernetes cluster that is uh, integrated with the solution. So, we looked at Kubernetes there. We looked at briefly Arc enabled Kubernetes and how we can use that to deploy apps with GitOps. We touched on Monitor and Defender. Azure Policy, as I said earlier, is a way to apply standardization and governance against, in this case, Kubernetes clusters. And a lot of um, Kubernetes related policies are there by default, and you can obviously define your own as well. But then as we go forward, as I mentioned before, we, Microsoft, are decoupling more and more Azure services from running exclusively in Microsoft data centers to be able to run on Kubernetes, Kubernetes outside of Microsoft data centers, but managed through Arc. And that's where Arc enabled machine learning with integration to Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, the Azure ML tools that uh, anyone who's played with Azure ML will be familiar with. The Arc enabled data services, so Postgres Hyperscale, SQL Managed Instance, integration with Azure Data Studio and again Azure Monitor, those are now instead of being exclusive PaaS services that only live in Azure, now they can run on Kubernetes on-prem. And then finally, very popular in Azure, the application services, web apps, logic apps, functions, to name a few. Those are all key parts of the Azure app service and that too, currently in preview, is decoupling from Azure to enable you to run on-premises uh, on Kubernetes, in this case on Azure Stack HCI. Again, all managed through Arc. So that is a whistle stop tour of, of kind of getting to know AKS HCI. If, if you only take one thing away, just know that it's easy to deploy and get going. You really can get going with this in a very short space of time and start to learn about Kubernetes and how it operates and how it's different from VMs in a very short space of time, whether it's on existing hardware, whether it's in an Azure VM, uh, you've got options there to, to, to download that. And you can just download straight from the PowerShell gallery or through uh, Windows Admin Center. Uh, the extensions built into the later versions of Windows Admin Center. And we've got loads of good documentation to help you on your learning journey. Loads of resources, you'll have the slides. I'll make them available to the team so they can share them. Uh, this is a really good one, actually, the Azure Arc Jumpstart. I'm sure it's probably been talked about on the session uh, or sessions previously. But if you're looking for sandboxes and scenarios to test in a similar way to what MS Lab provides for uh, some of the infrastructure components, the Jumpstart is, is a very powerful way to start to learn some of these ARC components across different areas of uh, not just Kubernetes. And that is me. So I will hand back to the team and check in if there are any questions. Yeah. Um... Matt, that, that was a very interesting presentation. So I think we learned a lot about the basics of um, Azure Kubernetes services. So I have some questions here. Um, okay. Let me see, they are 
Um, can we deploy AKS on Windows Server HCI clusters? And I mean, I think it's uh, Windows Server means storage spaces direct HCI clusters. Yes, you can. Yes. So we fully support uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI 20H2 or Windows Server 2019 uh, and Hyper-V based clusters. Now those clusters can be either using the 2019 HCI S2D or they can be using uh, a remote storage solution that presents a CSV. So if it's a SAN fiber channel iSCSI, that's fine. Um, but yeah, obviously we'd love for it to be HCI, but if that's not the case, that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what is the difference between AKS on Azure Stack HCI and Kubernetes services on Windows Server? Just the name, just the name. When you see the deployment and the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed in WAC, it displays as, um, the Azure Kubernetes, either Azure Kubernetes Service Runtime or Azure Kubernetes Runtime on Windows Server. It's purely a naming element today. Functionally wise, there wouldn't be a difference that you would you would uh, notice from an AKS HCI perspective. That's not to say there wouldn't be in the future. Uh, as we go forward with AKS HCI on Azure Stack HCI in particular, we've talked about some of the innovation that's going in exclusive to HCI, stretch cluster, uh, GPU support, some of those things will take uh, AKS, uh, sorry, Azure Stack HCI down a direction that separates from Windows Server. So in the future, you may find that AKS HCI could hypothetically take advantage of some of those features on one platform that don't exist on the other. Yes, um, because I wanted to, to ask a personal question um, because, because Today, as I understand, there is no difference uh, of uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI and AKS on Storage Spaces Direct and AKS on a general Hyper-V cluster. So why choose AKS uh, on Azure Stack HCI? But you, you kind of answered this question already because um, Azure Stack HCI has feature coming, for example, GPU support, and I think some containers could leverage uh, yep. GPU, uh, so, so this would only uh, run maybe on Azure Stack HCI and not on on, uh, on Storage Spaces Direct or so. Correct, yeah, GPU is a good example. Stretch clustering is another. Um, you know, we are working on validating and, uh, and um, scenarios where stretch clustering and AKS HCI uh, will work in harmony. That's something that we, we definitely want to achieve. Um, but I think in addition, you've got to think also about the the choices you're making when you deploy a subscription based Kubernetes service like AKS HCI, it's, it's a subscription. So there's many organizations out there who are looking to match that subscription approach on the, the hypervisor layer as well. So Azure Stack HCI plus AKS and roll all of those up to an Azure subscription. It does bring us back obviously to the Windows Server data center piece that we discussed in the round table earlier around licensing those guests. But from a container perspective um, and from an AKS perspective, it's, it does line up nicely with that, that subscription model of Azure Stack HCI. Mm. So I have a special question because, you know, I'm very interested in containers. I'm an, I'm an old virtual machine guy. <laughs> it was part of my life for the, the last 15, 16 years. And I, I, my Twitter handle is Hyper-V Server. <laughs> you may know that. But I'm, I'm very interested in containers. So we heard, for example, from Ben Armstrong two, 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 two years ago, there's a huge move from Windows workloads into Windows containers. Um, my problem actually is to find uh, useful examples for applications in Windows containers. So most of the Windows applications are uh, have a GUI. And as far as I know, uh, you don't have a GUI with a container. You sometimes have something like an, an VNC uh, client running and you, then you use something else. But uh, GUI and container is not is not quite uh, on, on the same level. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, and it, we it, heard also but, but just and we heard also from uh, from Jeff, there are some really interesting improvements in container in Windows Server 2022. Uh, so uh, something there you can help me with or even the audience because most of the guys here are Windows administrators, not Linux um, uh, Linux guys. And if they want to go to containers, of course, it's Windows and not usually not uh, always Linux, right? Yeah, uh, and you're right on, on the, the application. I think what we've seen most commonly with refactor or bringing with legacy 
Windows applications over is their legacy .NET applications that, that don't necessarily have that local clicking U, UI, but more of a web based experience potentially where you know you're accessing it wouldn't be any different accessing through the IP connecting to a container than it would be to a monolithic VM. So I think those would be considerations, but it also introduces the need of some organizations to refactor apps to take advantage, not necessarily just of containerizing on our platform, but containerizing on any platform. If they wanted to modernize that app onto the Azure app service, they're going to hit the same challenge as they would putting it in a container in terms of how you move away from that perhaps that local heavy GUI that, that represents that application. So I think the tooling we've provided, we, we provide some of the Windows Admin Center, we're working on more in, in Azure Migrate, will help organizations modernize uh, as many apps as we can, but there's going to be scenarios where the app needs to be refactored in an experienced way that, that does require more work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Windows Server 2022 will solve that necessarily, but we from the EKSHCI side are looking to support that uh, in the not too distant future, the, the Windows Server 2022 piece of the infrastructure. So is it fair that there will be all, uh, as long as we have Windows applications that can't be containerized because we don't have the developers anymore, the company who have, who have designed them are not available anymore, um, we need virtual machines uh, still around and there is not a move all in in containers so we will have a world where we still have a lot of vms because to be frank there's old applications running where nobody that are still needed but nobody can, is there to update them to a to a modernized app that that leverages uh, html and so on yeah, and, and but you've raised indirectly there, you've raised one of the key value points of the Microsoft solution because the Microsoft solution is not telling you you can only do VMs or you can only do containers. It's saying Azure Stack HCI plus AKS HCI is a VM and, Kubernetes and container solution. So if you do have legacy apps that run God forbid, a, a really old version of Windows and you can't get off it and the development team have gone away somewhere and there's just no way, leave it in a VM and protect it with your backup tools and monitor it with your monitoring tools and so on. Because you can do that on HCI and you can do it really well. And you can get great performance out of it because HCI will deliver that on modern hardware. But then for those that can, side by side on the same infrastructure, You've got your containerized platform that can modernize perhaps a different set of applications, but you end up with Azure potentially being a unification of management, of monitoring, of control of those different pieces at the infrastructure, at the app level and more. Uh, and it's a single platform without forcing you down one or the other, which there are vendors out there that, that can only deliver one on one platform. So it's uh, I think that is completely fair. And Microsoft's goal is to not rip VMs from your cold dead hands. It's definitely a, a best of both worlds where it's appropriate. Yeah, OK. Manfred, any questions from an old uh, VM guy also? We have two in the <laughs> chat. We have okay. two more in the chat. Oh, Maybe I didn't see should. that. Uh, we have one uh, about uh, can Windows Admin Center in gateway mode run in a container is here in the chat. It would be a great application. It's HTML5 based, right? Yes. Would be a great example for something in a container. Yeah, let me Good know how idea. you get on. Let me know how you get on with trying that. Yeah, I, it's a I service. Don't it's know. a Windows service. It, it, you're right. It, potentially. It would be a great know, example, by the way. I don't know if it's been tested or supported, but you're right. It's the kind of application stateless in the, in that sense it's a, it's a good exactly. candidate yeah it could be good idea manfred yeah good idea hang on i'm just going to i'm just going to write that down and steal that idea thank you yeah i, I think it because we don't we need something for the windows guys where they can see windows applications in containers because yeah. my problem is you know i'm i'm when i started as a unix developer so so a unix guy and unix developer i have attachments to linux and so on but uh, now starting with container or kubernetes it's a whole new world all the linux distributions whatever um the, the commands that are not the same on every different thing so you start fresh and that's yeah. scary for someone who, who has done windows for for ages right yeah and 
So we need something to 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 show it's also possible with Windows. But uh, before it takes me away, because this is re really something <laughs> I'm looking for. No, we could yeah, the we other, could get together and try question. it for sure. We could certainly yeah, try the, it. The, the, the other question is a little bit longer, and I think we have the answer already. I'm I'm double checking it. Um, so in a so in a short, you mean that how how to convert existing Windows VMs and apps running there to convert and get it running to uh, so it's the question about converting to the it's in the new track Carson I think it's related to the containers how can we convert existing VMs to containerized applications it's similar to what right. we discussed with the Windows admin center yeah I don't have no, that. I would yeah I, I would answer I would answer it in the same same essentially in the same way we well we actually have what I'll say is two approaches there's the Windows admin center approach which I, I believe it's a, an extension a container extension that can help you and don't forget, you're not converting the VM. You're capturing the app from the VM and you know taking off what it needs and, and putting it in a container. In addition to that, the Azure migrate functionality, which um, yes, today it does migrate to AKS. But as I said in the session, that doesn't limit it to living in AKS forever. Uh, therefore, today you could go via AKS to AKS HCI if you wanted to use the Azure migrate functionality instead. Um, so that's what I would say is the two options. There's probably more, mo most likely from third parties and, and the, the community as well. But from a Microsoft standpoint, especially on the Windows side, that's where um, the team have been investing um, uh, on, on helping you migrate those containers. So I, I have one addition to make, and you know that, Matt, of course, and you mentioned it, we need uh, AK AKS support for stretched uh, stretched uh, Azure Stack HCI clusters because this is a scenario many people waited for for stretched clusters and they want that for Kubernetes clusters as well. So yep. if you put data services on top, um, I think that's a huge demand for that and it's quite, I would say, needed. Where I'm yep. in contact with people who want to do uh, containers and AKS on top of Azure Stack HCI, they're, they're all, always talking about stretched clusters. Yep, and it's it's definitely a goal. You know, we are uh, we are validating. We're working with uh, customers as it stands to work through those requirements and what changes might need to be made and enhancements to AKS HCI in order to support the because there's a number of different scenarios as you know with Stretch. There's active passive, there's active active, there's synchronous asynchronous, different network configurations. So it's not a trivial amount of work to do the validation, but it's definitely we know that yeah. that flagship feature for HCI is important. And so we want to make sure that we take advantage of it as well, because it gives us a layer of redundancy and resiliency that without it is difficult to achieve. So, or would you or would you say I should push Mike for that? Because yeah, Mike is up 100%. next. Mike is up next.